I'm Emma Grace, and I'll be reading today's scripture. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God, in his justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews, who do have God's law, will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles, who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. This is God's word to you today. Please be seated. Thank you, Emma Grace. Good morning, New City. Great to be with you today. My name's Gabe. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, it's my privilege to share God's word with you today. We're continuing in our uh, series in Romans. And I think it's really cool that Emma Grace read that passage. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, when the Apostle Paul wrote... Romans as a letter to the five to seven house churches in Rome, he, he couldn't go there and be with them personally. So he sent his friend Phoebe to go and deliver this letter. And so uh, the first time that this letter would have been heard would have been in a, in a house church kind of environment in a home. And it would have been a female voice that people would have heard um, this letter and she would have helped to explain uh, Paul's intentions for the letter um, as she read it. And I think that's, that's a cool thing that we don't talk about a, a lot. Um, so I love that Emma Grace read that today and kind of got a flavor of what that might have been like to sit in a, a church and, and hear this read for the first time. Um, you know, we're, we're talking in Romans about uh, really uh, what is the good news and, and how do we live that out uh, as followers of Christ. And, you know, as I think about that theme um, kind of my preferred metaphor for thinking about life with Jesus, my spiritual life, is, is really life on a journey. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about your life that way before or your life with Jesus, life on a journey. I, I just like that metaphor of uh, I love hiking. I love being out in the woods. That was a love that was cultivated in me really early. Uh, I began my professional career actually as an infantry officer in the Army, which basically meant I got to paid to play in the woods with my friends for, for some years. Um, but ironically, one of the things I wasn't that good at was land navigation, was navigating from one point to another, um, being on a journey. I had a tendency to get lost. Anybody with me on that? Um, which is not, not great when you're like supposed to be the guy like leading others. And I have this one memory. Um, I have lots of memories, lots of stories. If we hang out long enough, You'll, you'll hear lots of them of times where I got lost and helped other people get lost too. Um, but one I was thinking about this morning, I was actually in kind of officer training, first learning to navigate at nighttime. And so it's like completely black outside, dark in the woods uh, outside Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, near Columbus, just south of Atlanta. And they sent us out two by two so that you wouldn't be lost, you know, by yourself because the 
the assumption was you're going to get lost, like you're, you're learning to navigate. Um, and so my friend Steve and I get sent out uh, into the woods to navigate. And I remember that there was, you're, you're, you're looking for these points in the woods. So there's like a destination you're trying to get to. And I remember this one, there was like two ways to get there. There was a slow way and a fast way. And the whole exercise was timed. And so in our hubris, we decided like, let's go the fast way, you know, and it wasn't the best way, but let's, let's go this fast way to get there. And I remember I was following Steve and when you're in the military, you have these uh, reflective strips on the back of your helmet called cat eyes and they glow in the dark. And so at night, all you could see, I was watching my friend Steve and I could just see these two cat eyes, these two glowing pieces of tape in front of me walking. And I was just following Steve through the woods. And I remember all of a sudden I heard a scream and the cat eyes disappeared and Steve was gone. And I, like a dummy, kept walking also. And uh, lo and behold, we had walked ourselves right, in, right into a, a ravine and had fallen down in this ravine. Fortunately, we um, were still pretty young and didn't actually get that hurt, but we were really embarrassed and uh, we failed the course that night. And I was just thinking about that, you know, it's, it's often the case that like when, when you're on a journey in life, there's a tendency to get lost, right? There's a tendency to go the wrong way. Um, sometimes to take the easy way instead of the harder way. Um, and, and I want to talk about that today because I think part of what Paul is introducing to us is this idea that life is a, a journey and there's lots of roads that we can, we can take. Um, there's a book that I love that just talks about uh, our life with Jesus uh, and it's called Invitation to a Journey. It's by a guy named Robert Muholland. And Muholland says this about the spiritual life. He says, everyone is in a process of spiritual formation we're being shaped into either the wholeness of the image of Christ or horribly destructive character of that image, destructive not only to ourselves, but also to others, for we inflict our brokenness upon them. The direction of our spiritual growth infuses all we do with our intimations of either life or death. And, and what Muholland is really saying is that in life, we always have two, at least two choices. You know, there's the choice to move towards life, the choice to move towards death, and the direction that we move in our life like really matters. Um, and we're either becoming like Christ and, and becoming like him and looking like him uh, and walking with him or we're moving away from him. And what we're going to look at in today's passage in Romans 2 is what does it look like? What do the roads look like when we move away from Jesus? Uh, what are our options? Because there's lots of options. But Paul lays out two roads essentially that lead away from God. And I want us to pay attention because um, you ever been to Carowinds? You know, uh, I know this is like, wait, where are we going with this, Carowinds? But you know, Carowinds straddles the line between North and South Carolina. Um, I remember as a kid, there was the line that said, this is the border. And we used to think it was really cool that you could stand on both sides, right? You're like, look, I'm in North and South Carolina at the same time. And as we talk about these roads today, what I want you to think about is it's, it's possible like that people can be journeying on actually both these roads at the same time. Um, and so I want us to just pay attention to what Paul is saying about these roads that lead away from God. And, and we all have tendencies to, to veer off course and um, to be on one or sometimes both of these roads. All right, the first road that we're going to talk about is is really a recap of what we talked about last week in Romans 1. I'm going to call this Road 1, and we find it in Romans 1. And I'm just going to read the last verses in Romans 1 to kind of describe what this road looks like that leads away from God. Verse 29, chapter 1. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. And so I'm going to name this road. This is kind of characteristics of like when people are running away from God and they're on this road. Last week we talked about that this is the way of the world. This is, this is the story that the world invites you into and that if you live without regard for God in the world, like in other words, live like he doesn't exist, like he doesn't matter, and you just kind of run the way that you want to run, this is what describes people eventually on that path, all those, all those things, the wickedness and sin and greed. 
um, and the broken relationships that come along with that. But I want to name this first road, the road of do what I want to. It's the road of I do what I want to. And, and our, our world is full of invitations to run on this road of just, just do what you want. It's fine. Get on this path. Like, you do you. You get on this path and you run, and if it feels good, you do it. You pursue your pleasure. You pursue your self-indulgence. Um, if it feels right to you, then you do it. And ultimately, on this road, like, we are at the center of the story, right? I'm in charge of my own life. I make my own way, and I choose what's right and wrong for me. It's the road of do what I want to. And we talked about how last week that road doesn't get you where you want to go. And by the way, neither one of these get us where we want to go. Just like Steve and I, we were trying to get somewhere, but instead we ended up at the bottom of a dark ravine, really embarrassed. And, and the road of do what I want to doesn't get us where we ultimately want to go. But there's a second road that we're going to really hone in on this morning. Um, and it's not an obvious road at first, because at first it seems like it might actually be a good road, but, it, but we're going to unpack how it's not, and it actually leads to the same place as road one. And this is the road, I'm labeling this, of I'm proud that I don't do what I want to do. It's the road that I'm, I'm proud that I don't do what I want to do. Okay, what am I talking about here? Um, what starts in chapter 2, verse 1 you may think you can condemn such people, talking about all the people that we just described on road one, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself or you judge others who do these very same things. And so what we're talking about here is if we're traveling on this road, we're running away from God, but this is the religious way of running away from God because Paul's talking now to the Jews. Remember in, in the church in Rome, we had uh, a very diverse church. We had Jews who kind of grew up knowing the story of God. They grew up with the Torah. They grew up with the law. Um, they were taught to follow the law. And then you had the Gentiles who would have come from the Roman culture who did not grow up with that background. And now we find that both groups are in the same community and Paul's writing to both groups and saying, your tendency is that bo both of you are going to lose your way left to your own devices. And both of you actually need Jesus. And that's ultimately what we're going to come to in the book of Romans. And so last week, the letter was primarily addressed to the Gentiles of saying, like, this is Roman culture, all these things, road number one, the road of do what I want to. Um, but now he's talking to the religious people, the Jews who've spent their life understanding the law. And, and what they're really defined by is that they love to follow the rules. And, and so there's a lie inherent when we're on the, the road of I'm proud that I don't do what I want to is that I'm really finding um, my identity in the rules themselves. And I'm looking at the other people who are living out the ways of the culture and their wickedness. And I'm saying those people are wicked and they should be punished. And this is an important differentiation because... Um, this isn't just simply saying, hey, that activity, those behaviors, those postures towards God are wrong, but it's, but it's saying that they're wrong with a particular attitude about it, basically saying, hey, you guys are lost, and, and now I'm glad because now I feel better about myself. In, in other words, uh, we want to pass judgment to believe that others are worthy of God's judgment while we're, we are not. So it's a posture of religious people saying, look, I'm shiny, I follow the rules, I've got my life together, look at me. And, and what's at the heart of that is actually the same thing that's at the heart of the people on road number one. And it's self at the center. It's self-centeredness for the people who are running away from God doing what the culture is telling them to do. But it's self-righteousness saying, I can make myself right with God by following enough rules, by doing enough good things. In other words, through religion, I can basically find my way toward God. And we know that just like the people on road number one, the people on road number two do not get where they want to go. Um, and, and there's an irony in this as well that just is inherent in human nature is that, and, and Paul talks about this, that like as we're judging people, guess what? We're doing the exact same thing ourselves, right? 
but we're hiding it, and we're hiding it behind a veneer of religiosity and rule following, but actually in our hearts, we're doing the exact same thing. And, and there's a dynamic here to pay attention to just relationally. Um, and I actually found, like, it was funny, sometimes God does this to me, is like I'm studying for a passage, and, and then something will happen in my life that he'll, he'll say, see, this is really for you too. And I just want to admit that before you guys, like sometimes I feel like I'm the, I'm the chief learner here. And like somebody asked me like whether I liked preaching or not. And I said, you know, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the opportunity. But like what I, what I really love is that God's working on me too. Um, every single time I'm in his word, he's working on me. And I hope he's working on you too as you're, as you're hearing this. But, um, you know, Janet and I were actually having an argument <laughs> This, this week, and I, like, blamed her for something, and then she pointed out, like, but you do the exact same thing that you're blaming me for, and I sat in that moment, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I totally do, and that's the dynamic here, because there's something that happens in relationships is that when we think we've got our act together, when we think we're the better than other people, then what we do is we excuse ourselves, but we condemn other people along the way. So we love to give ourselves a pass because we just say, you know what, like, it's, it's true that, like, I was impatient and unkind to you. If that's true. But, but guess what? I was tired. You know, like, I had a hard week. I got a lot going on. And so we give ourselves a pass. But, but then we look at our loved one, in this case for me and my wife, you know, and I can accuse her of the same thing, of you're being unkind and impatient with me. But I don't give her the same excuse and pass I give myself. Instead, I just give condemnation to her. And so we see this dynamic playing out all the time in our, in our lives. Um, it's a road of pride and self-centeredness and self-righteousness. Um, and I, I just got to say that, like, this is the road that, like, if you're a person who's grown up in the church, we have to be careful, right? Because we read this passage last week. That, that like named a ton of stuff that we see in our culture, right? We, we talked about ways in which people are sexually deviant, ways in which people behave in all kinds of ways that are grotesque that we would say like, I, I, I don't wanna talk about that, I don't wanna see that, um, that's ugly, you know? And, and we've kind of grown up in a Christian culture sometimes uh, where we say, well, those, those people over there are the bad people, but like we, we are the church, we're the good people. And we set up this dynamic of us and them, right? But what Paul points to, and, and it's the sucker punch, gut punch in chapter two, verse one, is he says, none of you have an excuse for you who are judging others do the exact same thing. So we're all in the same boat. We're all in our own way running away from God. Some of us are running away just saying, hey, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And some of us are, are running away from God saying, you know what? I'm so proud that I don't, I'm not like those people, but now my heart's even further away from, from God himself. All right. So I don't know what road you identify with in that. Maybe like me at Carowinds, you identify with a little bit of both. Um, but, or maybe it's one or the other. But I think in our own ways, we have a tendency um, to run away from God in the ways that Paul is talking about here. But here's the deal. Both of these roads ultimately lead to the same place. And, and this is what we have to catch here. Both roads lead to the same place. And that's what our passage today is really talking about. And there's a hard word in here, and that's a word judgment. And we don't, we don't like that word, do we? we? We don't like the word judgment, especially when it comes to God. Because we just like to think of God like he's our, he's our grandpa, or he's our Santa Claus, um, and he's just like, we need stuff, and I'm struggling in my life, and I just need him, and, and he's going to comfort me, and, and, and there's a kindness to God, and we're going to talk about that, but there's another side of who God is, is that God is a God of justice, and righteousness, and goodness, right? But you can't have justice, and righteousness, and goodness without judgment. It's not possible, and so we see that both these roads, the road of I do what I want to do in Romans 1 and the road of I'm proud that I don't do what I want to do described in Romans 2 and in the same place 
which is judgment. What does Paul say about judgment? First, in verse 2, he says that it's out of God's character because it's in his justice that he issues judgment. It's out of his character. It's part of who he is. That's part of what we need to understand about who God is. Verse 4, but there's something also, I'm going to just read that. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? What is Paul talking about there? What he's talking about is judgment deferred, judgment delayed. In other words, part of God's kindness is, yes, he is a judge, um, that in his justice, out of his character, he will bring judgment at the end of both of these roads, but he, he delays his full judgment and that he gives some now, that there is some judgment now. And we talked about the, this last week, right? That like when we're running away from God, when we're doing life according to our own terms, there's a consequence for that. And, and life doesn't go well. And, and we keep trying to figure out like, why isn't it working out? Like, why do my relationships keep not working out? Why, is thing, why aren't things lining up the way I want them to line up? And I'm running away from God. And part of that is because there's a piece of that judgment that happens now because when we're out of alignment with the king of the universe who's made everything to fit together, things just don't go well. But you see, there's a kindness to God that because he wants something for you that's more than we, you want for yourself, honestly, a lot of the time he's delayed this day of judgment and that gets us to verse 5, that there is a day of anger. And we talked about that last week too, this word anger. That God's anger isn't like this off-the-handle off the rage of just emotion and just smiting people. And that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is God is so pure. He is so good that he cannot tolerate anything that is less than that. And so it's his complete opposition to evil that we're talking about when it says there's a day of his anger, and that's a day when ultimately he says no more. No more. And he doesn't say no more to evil because he hates us. He says no more to evil because he's good, because he's loving, and because he wants more for you than sometimes you want for yourself. So we see that judgment's out of his character. We see that it's delayed, that there's eventually a day of anger. And we don't talk about this a lot in the church because it's uncomfortable. But verse 6, there's a day that he will judge everyone according to what they have done. Did you know that? That there's a day at the end of everyone's road where God judges what we have done and what we haven't done. In verses seven and eight unpack, he says, he will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after glory and honor and immortality. In other words, things outside of this life, things pointed outside of self, things pointed to God, these things that God offers. But here's my question for us. And this is a little bit of foreshadowing of where we're going in Romans, but Who is it who's kept on doing good? Is it you? I'll tell you, it's not me. There's probably 1,100 times this week that I ceased doing good in some way. In unkindness, in impatience, in thinking the worst of someone, of putting myself at the center of the story. You see... It's our tendency to run away from God. And so who is it that's kept on doing good? Because that person gets eternal life. That person gets to be with God. But you see, it's not you and it's not me. It's only one. And we're going to get to the one that's not us. But verse 8, but he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth, and instead live lives of wickedness. And that's a hard word because what he's saying is at the end of the road, God's absolute opposition to evil and disobedience in even the smallest form, even in Jesus ups the ante, right? You remember what Jesus said? He said, you know, some of you are proud that you're not a murderer, but he says, I tell you this, Right? If you've hated your brother or your sister, then you've committed murder in your own heart. 
And so what he's saying is it's not just the acts of evil that count against us on the day of judgment. It, it's, it's actually our thoughts and our intentions that count against us as well. And so what we see here is really bad news because every way we run away from God ends the same way, ends in God's judgment for everyone. And that unless you're the one who's kept on doing good, which we've just said is none of us according to God's standard, then it says he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, which guess what? That's every single person in this room. We've all lived for ourselves at some point, at many points along our journey. Verse 16 unpacks that, this in even a more poignant way. The day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. And that just hit me in a really profound way because we all have a secret life that we don't want to talk about. We have a life of things we think about. We, we, we have a life of, of, of things that, like desires that we have, or we have a life of things that we've done that we don't want other people to know about, right? And, and, and in polite company, we don't want to discuss, you know, those things. But verse 16 is clear. The end of the road, right, when we live for ourselves is the day is coming when Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. And I love the way Francis Schaeffer put this. He said, it's like uh, at the end of the road, at the end of time, at this day when God judges every single one of us, it's, it's like we have, and he, was, he lived a long time ago, so uh, he said it's like we have a tape recorder hanging around our neck for our whole life. Now it would be like, I don't know, some kind of digital recorder or something, right? Or just your phone, right? Which is always listening, by the way. Um, but Schaefer says it's like your whole life you've got this tape recorder that's recording everything that's happening in your life. Every word that comes out of your mouth, every conversation you're in. But imagine it's a tape recorder that can even record your thoughts. And it's recording. And what happens on the day of judgment, Schaefer says, is that God presses play. How do you feel about that right now? A day is coming when your secret life will be uncovered, that you'll be completely exposed before a pure and holy and good and loving God. There's got to be other news that follows because this news, if this is the end of the story, this is a really bad story for each of us because none of us make it through that day, if that's it. If it's just a sum total of the good we've done and the bad we've done and God hits play on it, we're all done. But yet that's what Paul is saying. That's the end of the road. And that's the end of the road for the person who follows the ways of the world on road number one. That's the end of the road for the religious person, the person sitting in church that's just like living by the rules, kind of doing the right things, but secretly judging and hating and thinking less of everybody else out there. And both roads lead to the same place. You know, um, Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 15 about a family, just to kind of give another angle on this story. He says, you know, there's, there's a father and the father represents God and, and, and the father has two sons and one's younger and one's older. He says the younger one, like despises his father and leaves his home and runs away and squanders all his wealth. And, you know, he's really a man on road number one, following the ways of the world. But there's an older son, too, that stays at home and follows the rules and does all the right things. But he has a secret. You see, his secret is that he secretly resents his younger brother and he passes judgment on him. Even when his young, younger brother comes back and repents and, and makes things right with the father. You see, um, the elder brother is a, is, a, is a picture of a person on the second road. And both are rebellious sons who deserve the father's judgment. 
You see, one son is lost in his self-indulgence. One is lost in self-righteousness. One is lost out loud. One is lost in silence, but they're both lost. One is lost outside the house. One's lost inside the house. And it can be just as dangerous to be lost inside the church even more so. And this is so important for me today for you to hear this is that because some of you are coming here, right? But you're far from God and you know it, but you're ashamed to admit it. And you're just like, man, if I can just do enough good things in my life, if I can just keep following enough of the rules, if I can just keep pretending and hiding, then maybe somehow everything will be okay. But that is not the story You see, we're all either the younger son who's running away from God doing whatever we want to do, or we're the older son who's trying to fake our way through life and pretending that we've got it all together. But here's where I want to end is that this is terrible news for us if this is the end of the story, but it's not. And the story in Luke 15 gives us a clue as to where we're going in Romans because there's a beautiful line, and I just I want to read it in this story that Jesus tells. And it's, it's not about either son running away from the father. It's about the father. And this is the moment that the younger son repents and decides to return home. It says, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father, who remember represents God. And I want you to just imagine this, that like we are the ones running away running away because we're doing what we want, running away because we're trying to follow the rules and be good. We're all running away. And and God is watching and seeing all this. But, But like when the son decides he's had enough, I'm going home, says his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him and he kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate. There's bad news that when you're running from God, it ends in God's judgment And that's a fact, but it's also a fact that God is compassionate and loving, and he's made a third way. There's another way out, but it's not a way of your own making, and it's not a way of the world's making. It's a way of God's making, and it's a way of Jesus. And we're going to keep exploring that, that when we follow Jesus, there's another way out of this bad news. To Christ be the glory today. And um, I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together as a way of remembering what God has done for us in making a new way. And Lord, we just thank you that you are a kind and good God. We thank you that you're holy and that you're pure, and that you don't just leave it to our, our own devices to make our way toward you. But Lord, that while we were yet sinners, while we're running from you in different ways, that, Lord, you're waiting for us when we return home. And then more than that, that you're running toward us. And so, Lord, we thank you, Father, for the gift of this table today. Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate in a visceral way, to remember that it's not up to us, that you have done it, and you've made a way for us to come home. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.